we're starting off with the um, mocking uh, uh, for uh, by the military. So 27, 27, verse 20, starting with verse 27 in chapter 27. Yes. Well, thank you. I'm glad you asked that. Uh, I, I don't, um, I, I always love it when somebody says that. So, uh, so here's the short form. Now, so this is going to be a rabbit trail. Somebody re reel me in in a minute. Christian apologetics is, uh, apologetics comes from a Greek word called apologia, which occurs a number of times in the New Testament, and it means in defense of. That's the Greek meaning. So it's a defense of um, Christianity. So as you can imagine, there are uh, Muslim apologetics, so there are Jewish apologists, there are atheist apologists, yes, that's a thing, and uh, all different kinds. So I am a Christian apologist. I give reasons why I think Christianity is true. And so I think, uh, and it's based really, the, the favorite verse that we have in the New Testament is 1 Peter 3.15 which basically says, always be ready to give a defense. That word, a defense, translated a defense, is the word apologia. So always be ready to give an apologia for the hope that you have within you. And then there's that annoying bit at the end of that verse that says, do it with gentleness and respect. So, um, we, so we have to do it that way too. We can't just be annoying with people. We have to give our reasons with gentleness and respect. Um, so there are uh, a million dollar apologists out there, uh, people like William Lane Craig, um, oh my goodness, there's other, Frank Turek, there's a bunch of them. Uh, I'm what you call a dollar apologist. They're the million dollar guys, I'm the one dollar apologist. Um, so uh, I think it's a command that we ought to be, uh, everyone ought to have um, an interest in being able to give good answers for why we believe what we believe. So I'll just add this and then I'll stop. <laughs> it is not trying to prove Christianity uh, beyond the shadow of a doubt. There's very little you can do that with. I can't even approve, for instance, that you guys exist and are not all in my, my mind today, but I have good reason to believe that's not true. But... Uh, I can offer you good evidence. It still takes a step of faith in order to believe. I don't think it's a leap. I do think it's a step. So I think there are good reasons for all of that. So anyway, reel me in, get me off of that now. So I'm going back to Matthew. Thank you, though, for that question, and you can bring any of those up you want. Uh, it doesn't mean I have an answer for everything either, by the way. I don't. So, uh, but I have a few. So Matthew 27, 27, we get, this is all a very familiar story, I'm sure, to uh, most of you. And I'm going to try and avoid where we have already covered some of these things uh, from other speakers like Wes last week talking about Barabbas. And, uh, and Kel had a, 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 a very vivid explanation of what happens when somebody is crucified. How many of you were here for Kel when he gave that? See, most of you were here for that, so I'm not going to go a lot into that detail again because you've already heard it once. We'll, we'll touch on it some. Uh, but so we're going to take the first, uh, uh, here's a fancy word for you, the first pericope. Uh, a pericope is what theologians like, a fancy word theologians like to throw out and say, kind of a subject matter that's contained in scripture. So if your translation probably has something in bold in front of it, mine for instance says uh, mocked by the military. How many of you have something like that right before? See most of you do. That's the title of the pericope. So today when you go home and you run into your kids or your grandchildren or whoever and they ask you what you studied today, you tell them I studied a pericope in Matthew, and and just, yes, watch them puzzle over that a little bit. Yes, ma'am. Oh, pericope? Oh, spell it? Oh, my. Um, <laughs> P-E-R-I-C-O-P-E, maybe. Check me out. <laughs> 
but that's something like that, pericope. So anyway, there's a, here's the word of the day to add to your vocabulary, uh, pericope. But it simply means a, a contained subject uh, of something. And so the, the one we're focusing on first is, being, is where Jesus has now been condemned, and he is uh, taken in by the military. So that's what's going on here. So let's read it real quick. I'm reading from the uh, Holman Christian Standard. It says, Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into headquarters and gathered the whole company around him. They stripped him and dressed him in a scarlet robe. They twisted together a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and placed a reed in his right hand. And they knelt down before him and mocked him. Hail, king of the Jews. Then they spit at him, took the reed, and kept hitting him on the head. When they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe, put his clothes on him, and led him away to crucify him. All right. So we're going to sort of take this verse by verse here. So the first part of this is the governor's soldiers, uh, of course these are the Romans, took Jesus into the praetorium. My translation calls it headquarters. Yours might say praetorium. Uh, Praetor is um, is the root word there in in uh, in Latin that was kind of means general a general place it's where the headquarters would be so translating praetorium to headquarters is is a good translation and yours might have something different so they take him in there um, and it says the whole company the whole garrison or the cohort anybody know how many men that normally included. More than that, more than 100. Getting there, <laughs> 600. We'll split the difference somewhere around. Anyway, that's what my source said it was. Your source may say something different. It's a lot, okay? So now, would they all have been there? Probably not. Uh, some of them would have been uh, on duty somewhere. But nonetheless, there probably was uh, a number of that. We can probably guess several hundred. So there was um, a lot of them there. And so uh, we see then that far from being compassionate for uh, this this meek person uh, that at least appears to be meek uh, to them, they take a lot of a lot of pleasure in uh, insulting him uh, after they take him in there. So they're, they're, they're having some fun with him. Uh, perhaps they were a little angry that they were given this person, you think, instead of Barabbas. We, we, we heard from Wes what kind of person Barabbas was. And so here they are making fun of him. Maybe they're a little angry. Why am I got this person who doesn't pose really a threat to us at all instead of uh, Barabbas who tried to kill some of us? And so... Uh, maybe they were angry for that, or maybe they just enjoyed torturing those weaker than them since they had the power to do so. So here we see something of uh, the depravity of human nature. Um, it's the uh, Christian worldview that explains this depravity in the, in the human nature. Uh, and in my opinion, the Christian worldview is the one that does that better than any other worldview. Now, you may be wondering what I mean by worldview. I simply mean those are the lenses through which you see and interpret to the world. So you may have an, a, some people may have an atheistic worldview. Some people may have a um, uh, Islamic worldview. It's simply the way you, you look at the world and you say, oh, this is the way I I interpret what's going on. Okay, so uh, that's that's what we're talking about here. Christianity explains why there's evil in the world because of the fall of man in the garden, and so that's why we expect from a Christian worldview to see this sort of thing happening because we know that mankind has this. Uh, tendency towards evil that lives within him and we see it come out. And so although we are sometimes surprised by the 
um, depth at which this evil can occur. Uh, it does not surprise us that it occurs, both mild forms of evil and even the terrible forms of evil. And we see this is why we have government. Scripture tells us that we have government because God uh, established government because he knew mankind was evil and we knew we had to have some sort of law or things would just run amok. Uh, I could go off into politics, but I won't. Uh, so, uh, so we see that we have right and wrong and Christianity explains that. And for the other worldviews to explain evil, uh, they have to sort of steal from the Christian worldview. I don't know if you ever thought about that. Uh, an atheist has no grounding for their worldview. And by grounding, I mean they have no source outside of them in which to, to say what's right and what's wrong. Christians do. We say God is the source of true goodness, and he is the one that establishes right and wrong. Under an atheistic worldview, um, it's just uh, the only thing you get reduced to under an atheistic worldview is power. You have to have power in order to force what you like to do and that sort of thing. So, mind you, I'm not saying atheists can't be good. I do believe they can be good because they're created in the image of, of God, but they have no grounding for that. It's just whatever they like. So, in order for them to say, uh, murder is wrong, rape is wrong. It's almost akin to saying, I like chocolate instead of vanilla. Or in my case, I like vanilla instead of chocolate. So, uh, so it's that kind of, of difficult to ground things. There's some other th difficulties with an atheistic worldview that I don't have time to go into. Uh, so let's go to verse 28. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. So note the color of the robe here. Uh, here it's scarlet. Mark says it's uh, purple. John says purple. Uh, Luke says <coughs> simply that it's a brilliant robe. So which is it? What do you think? So is... Um, so is scarlet the same as purple? So I like that because uh, here is where, uh, and I know we're in a serious subject here, so forgive me for a moment. But uh, I have learned, uh, having been married for 47 years, that women are much better at describing colors than men are. I, I have no doubt that had women written this, we would have gotten the perfect color, but Men, just we have about five colors, right, guys? Red, green, orange, yellow. I mean, that's it. But if if you ask a woman about, they have at least thirty more. Uh, I have discovered. So there's plum, maroon, lavender, strawberry. Uh, so I, I don't know. There could have been any of those types of things. So women are much better at that than men. But that that little joke aside. Um, there, this is a difference. It's not a big difference. It's a very minor difference. Uh, but uh, if you look at it from their perspective, when they dyed things, they would dye them in batches. But there was no guarantee. They didn't have the automated systems like we have today. So um, they would dye things in a huge vat, and maybe the next vat wasn't quite the same. You know, they didn't measure things. They had machines to measure all that out. And so different colors... They're, they're red or they're scarlet or they're purple might have varied, probably did vary a little bit in, in that day and time. And so what they might have called purple, somebody else may indeed have called scarlet. Uh, but uh, so there's no reason to, to think that this is a huge uh, discrepancy. And uh, in fact, the Greek word that's used here for that could be, uh, was used for the military cloak worn by emperors in their character as generals and other officers of high rank. So whatever it was, scarlet purple that the witnesses uh, describe, it was obviously recognizable as something that conveyed authority. 
And so they put that on Jesus in order to mock him and to, and to make fun of the fact that he was uh, said to be the king of the Jews. And so that was, that was their purpose. So here's, an, here's another by the way uh, in, from apologetics. This is exactly what you would expect to see in multiple independent witnesses. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, a little variant here, but had, had they all had the exact same description everywhere, it would have been a red flag, no pun intended. Why would it have been a red flag? What happens if you have a witness in court and they all say exactly the same thing? Somebody gave them the words, they colluded. And so when you see these small variants, that's what you would expect if those witnesses were independent telling the truth about what they saw. In fact, if you've not heard of him, uh, there is a Christian apologist by the name of J. Warner Wallace. Anybody heard of J. Warner Wallace? All right, well, now you have. J. Warner Wallace is a retired cold case detective. He was even on a TV show. What was the TV show where they did those? 60 Minutes or something like that. Um, not lately, but a while back. Yes. California. No. <laughs> I wish, because I'm from Texas, but but I but no, he's he's California, uh, and so uh, so here very briefly is J. Warner Wallace when he was a cold detective. He said I wanted nothing to do with Christianity, and uh, and and so I thought because you know what I had a lot of those guys in the back of my squad car. He he said this is this is from him. He said I would go out and arrest burglars and. Uh, people beating their wives and all kinds of things. And uh, a lot of them would get in the back of my squad car and they would start weeping. And you say, you know, I'm a Christian. I don't know why I did this. And he would just think, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. So, so he said this Christian thing, he had the worst examples of Christianity, if you will, in the back of his squad car. And so he wanted nothing to do with Christianity. And then he goes home one day and his wife says, you guessed it. I'm a Christian now. And he says, well, that, I'm not standing for that. I've had too many of these guys. I know better. And so he says, I'm, I'm going to go to, she begged him to go to church. He went to church and he picked up a Bible. They gave him a Bible. Oh, imagine that. Who else gives Bibles out in church? We do. <laughs> Never know what's, how that's going to affect somebody. But he picked up, they gave him a Bible. He says, well, okay, I'm going to read it. And he says, I sit down with criminals every day, and I hear their stories, and I've done it for, for 20, 30 years. I know when they're lying to me. I can just tell now because I know when they're spinning a story to me. He picks up and reads the New Testament, and he says, you know what? This is what I would expect from an honest person. <laughs> I always tear up at this. If you've ever heard J. Warner Wallace, tell the story it's it's terrific but he said this is exactly what i would expect to hear from somebody telling the truth he says as a cold case detective if these stories had all been the same i would have rejected it but they had enough variance from their point of view he says this is real testimony he ends up being converted becomes a uh, a christian apologist he has a website called Cold Case Christianity. So now you know who J. Warner Wallace is. Look him up, get his book, uh, Cold Case Christianity. You will, you will love that. All right, back to the lesson. You know, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, my guess is that it wasn't overnight. It took, um, um, it took some time. Um, probably a couple of years, if I'm remembering correctly. We often think, yes, we often think these things, wow, they just happened, and we get disappointed because we, we witness to somebody and we think, well, that failed because they didn't immediately bow the knee. And, but you're planting seeds. So there's another apologist out there called um, 
um, Greg Kokel. And he says, this is my goal. It's not that when I go out to witness that I expect everyone to be converted immediately. He says, it's great if that happens. But he says, you know what, 90% of the time that isn't what happens. What happens is I get to plant a seed. And you, you know that story from the New Testament. Some plant, some water, others, uh, others do the reaping. He says, so when you go out and do that, you're not, you, you have to get to know the person you're talking to. You have to know where they are in their, in their uh, journey. And you may do no more than plant a seed, and you may not know anything about what effect that had uh, this side of glory. So we don't, we don't know. But that's our responsibility is to do as much as, uh, as we can, even if it's just plant the seed. So you do not fail. If you pass out that Bible, you have no idea uh, what effect that might have down the road. So we need to always be cognizant of that and not feel like failures because we didn't bring anybody to the Lord in that instance. Now, hopefully, along the way, you've had a few of those. Uh, but, all right, so verse 29, and then uh, it says, They twisted together a crown of thorns, set it on his head, put a staff in his, in his uh, right hand, knelt in front of him, mocked him. Now remember, this is probably hundreds of, this went on for a while probably. So it's, it's, it's in the garrison, it's probably hundreds of them. Whether they all participated or not, I don't know. Uh, but they're having fun with it and saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and so forth. So crown of thorns, isn't it ironic uh, that in Genesis 3.18, the ground is cursed because of the sin of Adam and Eve. And what does it say? Thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. So here are thorns and thistles. Uh, and if we take it back to Genesis, it's, it's almost illustrative of him bearing for us. He does so much more after this, but bearing for us uh, the curse, if you will, uh, that was received in the Garden of Adam, uh, in, in the Garden of, of Eden. Uh, then he has a staff, and it could have been a stalk, either it could have been uh, one, one fellow I read said it's possible it was sugar cane. Others say it might have been a papyrus reed uh, of some sort. Um, what is papyrus famous for? Paper, yes. So if you are familiar with the uh, writings of the New Testament, most of that was on papyrus. Now, is papyrus, so again, you can see sort of the illustration there. They're placing in his hand what will become the paper on which the message of Jesus to the world will be written. And so that's kind of ironic in a way, isn't it, in, in that case. Um, so anyway, the staff was, was a symbol, of course, of uh, that all the, uh, under the empire with, with Greek and Eastern kings had become their, their symbol of, of sovereignty. So of course, they meant that in derision. Uh, but, of course, someday we know all Gentiles uh, shall do that in earnest, not in derision. They will all, all the nations shall worship and bow the knee before him, as we're promised later on. Uh, so this term that's used, the, the Greek in, in, in Mark 15, 19, implies a continued act. So they're filing, most likely filing before him doing this mocking uh, as they participate in that. Matthew 27, 30, it says they spit on him. They took the staff, struck him on the head again and again. So uh, they take the mock scepter from his hands, and one after the other as they pass by, they strike him on the head. And, of course, at every blow, those thorns are driven deeper into his head. Uh, as they mock him. Uh, in other gospel accounts, this is somewhere, uh, this is thought where they might, in the other gospels accounts, take him back out to show him before uh, Pilate once more, as Wes described it, makes an attempt to say, look, here's your king. I punished him. He's got this mocking robe on him. 
crown of thorns. He, he's been beaten. He looks terrible. So as Wes said, they try, he tries one more time to get them to let him go, uh, maybe because of the dream of his wife. But of course, as, as Wes said, that doesn't happen. Uh, so 31 says, after they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. So uh, more agony as the cloak is removed. <coughs> and his own clothes, uh, or a tunic at least, and perhaps a cloak is pulled over his head, uh, which would have added to the agony of his already ripped and torn flesh. If you've ever had a, an injury where you've had clothes on and it has bled and then it dries for a while and then you have to take that off, that's not a fun experience, but that's very likely through all the beatings and the showcase and everything else that's happening to Jesus, that's part of what's happening to him. Uh, then in, in 32, it says, as they were going out, so this is... Um, uh, this is still the same pericope. They were going out. They met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. Okay. So the, the question you might have, that we all might have, is out of the whole crowd that was streaming to and fro, uh, watching and going about their own business or whatever it is they were doing, on the way to the place of execution, did they seize on this fellow? by the name of Cyrene. Well, we don't know a whole lot, but we do know a little, and some from the other um, synoptic gospels that, ex that explains a little bit more about Cyrene. We do know that Cyrene that, uh, uh, itself was a city of, uh, in what we would call modern-day Libya in North Africa. At that point in time, it would have been a Greek colony. And there seems to have been a flourishing settlement of Jews in Cyrene. And members uh, were told in Acts chapter 2 that members of that community appeared as prominent in the crowd in the day of Pentecost. So there were believers coming from that group of, of people. Uh, perhaps this is one of them, or he was recognized as one of them. So uh, there are also Cyrenians among those who opposed Stephen. If you remember in the book of Acts, the stoning of Stephen, in Acts chapter 6, uh, some of them, though, are converted and at some point uh, were among those who witnessed in, uh, in Acts chapter 11, witnessed to the Greeks. And so we're told in Acts 11 that there were Cyrenian believers who go and witness to some of the Greeks. And so whatever happened with this group of Cyrenians, uh, perhaps Simon was one of them, uh, in the beginning they mock, uh, but at least some of them believe and become converted. Uh, and so uh, we can see that there's, maybe the lesson here is that we should never give up on praying and working with those who seem to us to be the most unlikely converts. J. Warner Wallace would have told you he was a very unlikely convert. And he said that uh, I, I didn't want to have anything to do with that. Uh, but look what happened to him. Uh, and there are others that testify that way as well. So maybe you have some of those in your family, I do, uh, that you continue to pray for, and you should and you continue to witness. Maybe you've had good conversations with them. Maybe they don't want to have any conversations, but we still don't give up uh, because we have stories like this throughout the Bible that show that uh, as long as they're here, there's still an opportunity. Okay, so, And they make some of the most surprising and incredible testimonies. Also in the parallel of this in Mark 15:21. It tells us, uh, it says, now Simon of Cyrene, it says he's the father of Alexander and Rufus and was passing by on his way in from the country and the soldiers then forced him to carry the cross of Jesus. <coughs> so he's the father of Alexander and Rufus. So we get a little bit more information uh, in uh, Mark about, about uh, Simon. 
Uh, and that fact is recorded there in Mark. We don't have it any place else, uh, but the two names are, are common and we cannot arrive at more than a probable identification. But there is a Rufus chosen in the Lord as prominent among the Christians of Rome, talked about in Romans 16. Is that the same Rufus? Can't say with certainty, but maybe. Maybe, maybe that's part of what's going on here. This is a family that has come to believe. Uh, can't say with certainty, though. Uh, but Rufus there in, in Romans is one of two brothers that is mentioned. And, there, and if that's true, if he is related to Simon, then there's some other interesting things that follow from that because Paul, when he speaks in Romans 16, when he speaks of the mother of Rufus, he says the mother of Rufus also, uh, he, he speaks of her as also his mother. So for Paul, uh, the mother of Rufus was somebody that was very close to Paul and that ministered uh, to him. And so this could be a part of the extended family. We, we can't say with certainty. Uh, but it's interesting that Somebody like that was very close to Paul. Okay. Um, and then if you go read Luke's account in, uh, of, of this in Acts 11, there is prominence given to men of Cyrene. And so there we see that there is indeed a group of men from Cyrene who are active in the Christian faith at that point. And so... Some of that speculation, but uh, I like to think that it's, it's there for a reason and that this is evidence of the uh, effect that Jesus had on this person perhaps taken out of the crowd. All right, Matthew twenty-seven thirty-three says, they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Um, sometimes we have a more familiar name of this, um, uh, called Calvary. Anybody ever wondered where we got the name Calvary out of Golgotha? Well, I looked it up. <laughs> That's not my new off the top of my head, but I looked it up, and uh, it's from the Latin translation of Scripture, which is referred to as the Vulgate. So if you hear sometimes, now if you grew up a Roman Catholic, you know what a Vulgate, you know what the Vulgate is. That's the Latin translation used in the Roman church, at least until Vatican II in the 60s, when they switched to English. That was my, I was pre-Vatican II when I was Catholic. So, but anyway, that's, that's what the Vulgate is. It's the Latin translation. So the Latin translation for the place, for the skull, is Calvarium. <coughs> so now you know where they get the term Calvary. Uh, my wife's pointing water at me. Um, sure. I like coffee, but <laughs> um, thank you. Okay. So anyway, that's where the, that's where the term Calvary comes from. So nothing wrong with calling it Calvary. In your mind, you just now need you you now know that's simply the Latin from the place of the skull. Okay. Then Mark 27, 34, it says they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with uh, gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. Now, your translation might have something different there. It might say vinegar or something like that. I'm sorry, bile, okay. Uh, bile today, when you hear that in English, it's not a uh, very pleasant thing, is it? Uh, so... Uh, but all that to say is that they weren't exactly sure what that was. Others call it myrrh. Uh, and I had one uh, theologian suggested it might have even been in a form of hemlock uh, or even poppy juice. Uh, but there are no sources with certainty. So, the, um, so we have different meanings of it. What we can be sure of. Um, is that it was something that was sometimes given in order to dull the senses, of whatever it was. Uh, it was meant to alleviate some of what they were going through. Uh, 
the sour wine we often hear about, and we're going to see that again later on, is offered to uh, Jesus near the end of his crucifixion, near the end of his death. And that also sometimes is referred to as vinegar. Uh, vinegar in that time was a drink consisting of wine, generally uh, turned sour or sometimes mixed with water, um, a common drink of the Roman soldiers uh, at that point. Wow, that's a good story. I'm I'm glad you shared that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, my mom did not cook that much, so uh, I I had no I have no good knowledge of that. So thank you for that. I'm going to steal that story, by the way. Uh, if if I ever get to teach this again, I'll steal that story. I tell people when I teach apologetics, everything I teach is stolen from somebody else. Uh, I have very few original thoughts, and I don't. Uh, as long as you give good acknowledgement, so forever and f as long as I'm able to teach Tommy, if I use that story, you will be accredited with that story. Yeah. You <laughs> okay. Good. Okay. All right. I had not heard that before. Very good. All right. Um, now, it is interesting, in Psalm 68, 22, it says, they gave me gall for my food, they gave me vinegar for my drink. Now, we can't and don't have time to go into all the Old Testament uh, descriptions of uh, predictions, really, if you will, of what's happening here, even on the cross. But there are many, <coughs> many. Uh, somebody once asked me, well, I think Jesus did, just did those things so he could pretend that he was fulfilling them. Eh, I don't think so. Uh, th that would be a stupendous feat if somebody could make all of those things. There's, there's over 100, maybe 150, I don't know, something like that. Prophecies and little things like that you have to get right in order for what Jesus did to be fulfilled. And it's just out of the realm of even mathematical possibility for something like that to happen. Uh, so Psalm 68 almost describes to a T what's going on while Jesus is on the cross there. Now, some commentary says it's probable that the, the offer of this came from uh, some of the women that were following him, maybe. Uh, and maybe, maybe they managed to convince the soldiers to do that. Maybe it was a common thing. Again, can't say with certainty but at least some might suggest that. We're going to talk more about the woman in, uh, in a, a little while, if we have time. I see I'm already not going to have time to finish, but that's okay. Um, so uh, let's go to the next part. Why did he refuse it? What do you think? Yeah, so I think I like that explanation. It's uh, it, it says he sort of tasted it and said no. So he's uh, he wants to have all his faculties, and so he perhaps refuses to drink it. He was willing to endure everything that was coming uh, without mitigation. So he he and he wanted all the powers of his mind and body uh, to undertake what was still coming before him. Horrific things already happened, but more horrific things are coming. And he still wanted to have his senses and self-consciousness unimpaired uh, for that end. Okay. Now, this shouldn't be confused with the passage in John 19.28, where Jesus, near the end, does take a, a, a drink from a sponge on a stalk of a hyssop plant. And that's, that's probably where we see the wine mixed with vinegar or some other substance. Uh, it's near the end. 
where he says it is finished. So that's a different thing. Matthew 27, uh, 35. When they had crucified him, it says they divided up his clothes by casting lots. So the cross uh, employed in capital punishment in Roman form varied a bit. Uh, it sometimes was a stake on which uh, the sufferer was impaled. It sometimes consisted of two pieces of timber put together to form a T or even an X. In this instance, uh, the fact that there was a title as we read in some of the uh, Synoptic Gospels, there was a title uh, that was nailed over his head. That would suggest what we traditionally think of as the cross that we see uh, in, in a lot of auditoriums today. Uh, so in, in carrying uh, the sentence of crucifixion into effect, the cross is, is laid on the ground. The condemned man is then stripped and laid bare on it, sometimes uh, in other instances, we know he was simply tied, but in this instance, nails are driven through the wrist and feet. Uh, I think Kel described how normally we think of it through the hands, and that's how some translations have it, but that would easily tear out, and so they place it through the wrist in order to make sure it doesn't tear. And they may have additionally tied it as, as well. Um, and sometimes you had that little projecting ledge where they could put their feet, and that was so they could raise up and breathe. That ledge actually prolonged the agony on the cross by allowing them to breathe longer. Okay. So, and then the clothes of the criminal were the usual, usual reward of the executioners, and in this case included, as we find from John, the, the tunic he wore next to the body as well as the outer garment. And it was as, at that time they were nailing him to the cross that he was praying, as, we, as is recorded in Luke, uh, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So, a, a little rabbit trail. <clears throat> was Jesus crucified on a cross pole or a stake? Uh, so as we just discussed, it may, and it may come as a surprise, maybe not to some of us, but... Uh, as we discussed, the precise shape, uh, we can't tell just from what we see, but we can infer some things of the shape from what we read in the, the scripture. The Greek word translated cross uh, can mean a pole or a cross used in an instrument. So the, the Greek there is not real clear. Um, and, and thus, it could mean a pole or a stake. Uh, and... Uh, but most don't think so. Uh, if we look back at Roman history, the Romans actually were not picky about how they crucified someone. And so in, in uh, history, we find that the Romans would use sometimes whatever was at hand in order to accomplish the task. I think they like the cross as we know it, or the X uh, form of the cross, or two timber beams, whatever was handy. Um, but it's, it's not out, uh, in some cases in Roman history, we see them nailing people to walls and to roofs, whatever they could find at the moment to accomplish the task. Now, we don't think that's what happened here, uh, but historically, uh, we know that. Uh, but whatever it was, even if some don't agree with the cross, yes. Yes, so um, other, in other places uh, we learn that it, it is common to put it up there in not just the Latin, but the other languages of the people. So Latin, yes, because they want, that's, that was the Romans' official language, but it would have also been up there in Greek and Hebrew and others of that nature. Now, I don't know that I'm going to have time to get to it today, but when you get further down, you see that the exact words, there's, there's differences in, the, in all four 
Gospels describe that there was something written there, but they differ in exactly what that is. Some says G, the king of the Jews, others have something slightly different. Uh, but what you're talking about, you see up there, we get that, of course, from artists and things like that who are doing their best to depict that. But most likely it was multiple languages. And so there were multiple lines and people, depending on their language, might have read that. And so they reported it differently to the different eyewitnesses that the other gospel writers pick up in there. And so that's one explanation of that uh, that we see. So we can't say with certainty, but that was the common practice to write it in multiple languages uh, for where they were. And of course, Aramaic, uh, not only Latin, Aramaic, Hebrew, Greek was the common language. That's why Greek, the New Testament is largely written in Greek. That was the common language in the Roman Empire at that time. So everybody was supposed to know Greek, and so they could communicate. So, so all of those, all four of those languages may have appeared on there. So, don't know if that helps. Can't say with certainty, though. <laughs> uh, so, so I've just got a few minutes, so I'm just going to throw this in. Uh, certain cults, most notably Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, are adamant that Jesus did not die on a cross and that the cross is in fact a pagan symbol. So that um, their, their insistence on that point is rather curious given the ambiguity as we just talked about of the, of the Greek there. But in their translation, their translation in Jehovah's Witnesses is called the New World Translation. Um, so if you're going out this afternoon to get a new Bible and you wonder what translations to pick, I'll tell you one not to pick. It's called the New World Translation. <laughs> How to pick a good translation is a whole other subject, but don't pick that one because it has been conformed to their beliefs, not the other way around. That's not the way we do Christianity. Christianity, we want to know what the original Greek said so that we can conform to it. We don't want to rewrite it to conform to what we believe. Yes. That's more Jehovah's Witnesses. So the stake, the stake would have been one pole and your hands would have been up here. Now they get the tree because in the Old Testament it talks about being hanged on a tree. And that was a common expression, if you will, of somebody uh, being hanged uh, or nailed or whatever you want to call it. And so that's another prophecy that Jesus fulfilled. So we think of a tree, we think of all the branches and all that, but they're just talking about wood, basically. And that's, that's all that's really going on there. So yeah, so this is, this is stake, and pun intended, Jehovah's Witnesses stake their beliefs on that. So that <laughs> got to get a little dad joke in once in a while. So, uh, so what you see in cults like that is they have to stake their territory on something, and so they they uh, they try to make themselves they they take a hard stand on something that you don't need to take a hard stand on, and so you see they, they differentiate themselves that way. Um, so we do that. So Jehovah's Witnesses, of course, also deny the deity of Christ and his, and his bodily resurrection. Um, so there, it stands to reason they might also object to uh, other things as well. Okay. So a couple of other things, and uh, we'll wrap this up. Testament. One of these is found in John 21. Jesus gives Peter a glimpse of the manner of death in John 21. He says to Peter, when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you don't want, where you don't want to go. A possible uh, interpretation of that is they will stretch out your hands. Well, what does that look like? And tradition has Peter being what? Crucified upside down. It's a good tradition. Then don't crucify me like, uh, like my Lord. 
crucify me up and down. And so they do that for him. It takes a lot longer to die perhaps that way. I don't know. Uh, and then also, uh, the other clue that it's the cross as we traditionally believe it is found in John 20, where Thomas, I don't know why he's named after Thomas, but here I am, in his famous moment of doubt says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails, plural, uh, in his hands. So it's not nail mark in his hands. It is the it is the plural that's translated there. So there are multiple nail marks in his hands, one in each hand. So again, not 100%, but uh, another clue that maybe that's the traditional cross as uh, as we might believe it. Actually in his wrist, but yeah. Okay. Oh. Uh, so one more thing, and I'm going to close. Islam denies that Jesus was crucified, just so you know that. Uh, Islam, uh, there's two verses in the Quran which state that um, it goes like this. We killed, uh, oh, it says, they, that they said, they're talking about Christians now, that they said, we killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the apostle of Allah, but they killed him not, nor crucified him, but so it was made to appear to them, and those who differ therein are full of doubts with no certain knowledge, but only conjecture to follow. For a surety they killed him not. Nay, Allah raised him up unto himself, and Allah is exalted in power. Thus the Quran teaches that Jesus did not die on the cross, but that it was mess- it was made to appear that he died on the cross. Now, among historians, you will be hard-pressed to find anyone, number one, who believes that Jesus didn't exist, and number two, that he didn't die and was crucified. Almost all historians agree with that. This is a major illustration of of a, a huge, huge error in the Quran, among others. I may speak, but another one. And so this is something uh, also I just, I just learned, and I'll, I'll close with this. Uh, in the second century, there was a Christian writer by the name of Arrhenius, uh, early church father. You may have heard of Arrhenius, second, maybe, I think, third generation Christian. So the Apostle John had a, had a follower, had a, had a uh, believer that he tutored called Polycarp, Polycarp tutor Arrhenius, so third generation Christian, and he's, he writes this about a Gnostic leader in his time. Now, I, can't, I don't have time to go into Gnosticism, but it suffice to say that Gnosticism was a belief in the second century that flesh bad, spirit good, and uh, so, um, and there's a lot more baggage there I could give you with. But listen to this from from Arrhenius' quote about the Gnostics. He did not himself suffer death, but Simon, a certain man of Cyrene, being compelled, bore the cross in his stead, so that this latter being transfigured by him, that he might be thought to be Jesus, was crucified through ignorance and error, while Jesus himself received the form of, of Simon and standing by laughed at them, for since he was an incorporeal power, and the mind of the unborn father, he transfigured himself as he pleased and thus ascended to him, uh, deriding them inasmuch as he could not be laid hold of. What does that sound like? Sounds like the Quran, <laughs> written hundreds of years before the passage in the Quran. Could it have been that Muhammad borrowed something from? the Gnostics to put in the Quran, again, trying to make things look a little interesting. All right, we're out of time. Uh, So I'm going to stop there. Uh, I'm going to pretend I got all the way through the end, and we're picking up on verse 32 next time, because we we at least read it, didn't we? So that's good. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this time together, and we thank you for... uh, everyone that's here today, and we pray that you might bless us uh, for the rest of this day, through the holiday season to come. 
Help us, Lord, to be bold in our, in our <clears throat> witness for you. And also give us those opportunities where we might plant the seed. In Jesus' name, amen.